introduce the next panel. These are three uh, gentlemen who have had um, uh, a real hand in uh, building this uh, U.S.-Vietnam relationship over the last 20 years from different, uh, from different perspectives. Um, Scott, as you've heard uh, from the very beginning, as a, as a career foreign service officer, uh, building the, uh, the bricks and mortar of the relationship from a policy perspective. Chris Brose, who is uh, with Senator McCain's office. Uh, Senator, I think everyone here recognizes that um, um, Secretary Kerry and Senator McCain um, are probably two of the pillars of the U.S.-Vietnam relationship. Their work uh, on the relationship had been, has been uh, tireless uh, and has uh, moved from um, uh, making uh, critical assessments to trying to support uh, some ambition and I guess as the Deputy Prime Minister mentioned, imagination. And Murray Hebert, who is my colleague here at CSIS, uh, and for those of you who, like me, uh, grew up reading his articles in the Far Eastern Economic Review and the Wall Street Journal, uh, has been on this beat, literally, for, uh, uh, for a couple decades, really working on uh, uh, looking at the relationship um, from the ground up. Uh, these gentlemen uh, have agreed to uh, talk a little bit about the relationship as we launch uh, our new study. And so let me uh, turn first to uh, Scott. You get the first cut, if you would, and, uh, and then I'll, I'll invite the others to uh, make their comments, and then we'll open it up for uh, question and answer. Thank you. Um, thanks, Ernie. I, I didn't make uh, prepare any remarks. Sure. I thought I would just um, offer a few observations. Um, uh, you know, it's interesting that, uh, I mean, we all know the history between the United States and Vietnam, and, and it was really in the mid to late 1980s that um, uh, people began to uh, work together uh, between the two countries, uh, focused first and, and foremost on uh, the MIA issue, uh, accounting for our missing servicemen from the war, which is in a way an unusual way of starting a relationship, but in this case a very necessary and appropriate way. Um, and, and the movement toward normalization involved progress on that front, as well as uh, Vietnam agreeing to remove its troops from Cambodia and allowing people in re-education camps to leave and some other things. That was a long time ago, but it was an important uh, way of starting the relationship. Um, and, and since that time, as I mentioned in my, uh, when I introduced the Deputy Prime Minister, it, it's been a relationship that's really developed based on a very pragmatic approach, I would argue, and very strategic approach from both governments, that there were areas in which we could work together that would benefit the American people and the Vietnamese people. Uh, certainly on the trade and economic side, that's been a big part of it. Uh, first developing a bilateral trade agreement and, of course, now working on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which should create a lot of opportunities in, in both countries. Uh, as the Deputy Prime Minister mentioned, very much building the people-to-people um, -people relationship, including with a large Fulbright program, uh, opportunities for Vietnamese students to come and study in the United States and more and more exchange programs uh, back and forth. Uh, certainly in the diplomatic realm, uh, where we work together quite well in, in ASEAN. Uh, obviously, we're not a member of ASEAN, but we work a lot with ASEAN in the East Asia Summit in APAC, basically trying to promote regional peace, stability, security, and, and cooperation, and we found Vietnam to be a good partner. But increasingly in recent years, we're working together in things like health, and energy and the environment, climate change, since Vietnam is a country that's um, already being affected by climate change and could be uh, deeply affected by climate change, rising waters. And, and so these are you know, regional, regional and global issues where we've developed, uh, I think, a very uh, good cooperative effort. The, the security, the military-to-military -military relationship has gone a little bit more slowly, which I think you know, reflects some caution on both sides. I won't speak for the Vietnamese government, but on our side, certainly uh, continuing concerns about human rights in Vietnam, about which we have a pretty open and regular dialogue, as the Deputy Prime Minister mentioned. Uh, but nonetheless, we've seen uh, continued cooperation in these areas. Uh, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, General Dempsey, was out uh, recently in Vietnam for a very good discussion about very practical cooperation, uh, including a lot on humanitarian assistance, uh, and, and working together in the region. Um, so that's been, uh, as I said, a slower area, but an important area. 
And last but not least, addressing still some of the, some of the legacies of the past and on the humanitarian side, uh, for us still accounting for uh, missing Americans, very important. Also doing what we can to help the Vietnamese account for their missing. Uh, but working together also on, in uh, dioxin remediation. I was visiting our um, project in, uh, at Da Nang Airport on that just a, a month or so ago. So it's become a good, broad, healthy, and in many ways very normal relationship uh, that uh, I think there's every reason to believe it can continue to grow. Certainly that's our commitment under the comprehensive partnership. Uh, the one area where we, we tend to have some differences and slows us down is, is human rights. Uh, we have to just keep working on that area in a very professional and, and appropriate way, and we'll do that. Um, I'll stop there and pass it on to Chris and Murray. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Ernie, for giving me the opportunity to be here. Um, you know, you're very kind in your introduction. I am most certainly uh, not a Vietnam expert. I'm surrounded by Vietnam experts. Um, I commend the report that Murray has written uh, along with his co-authors to you. Uh, and as you heard, you know, Scott has been working on this relationship since 1993. And I mentioned to him, uh, for my own sake, I will not mention to you what I was doing in 1993. Um, needless to say, it would further the argument that I'm not a Vietnam expert. Um, what, what I want to do is just give you a couple minutes of, of sort of how the Hill uh, has, has viewed the U.S.-Vietnam relationship recently. Uh, some ways in which uh, we have been engaging on this. I uh, would completely agree with the comments earlier that, you know, from the very beginning of this uh, process of normalization, you know, the, the Congress has played a really critical role uh, uh, from the uh, POW MIA issue that my boss and then Senator, now Secretary Kerry, uh, helped to lead uh, through the process of consultation, you know, all the way up to where we are currently. And I think where we are now is uh, there's a lot of business that Vietnam has before the Congress. Uh, the uh, 123 Civil Nuclear Agreement, uh, which was just uh, brought into force, uh, the whole question of TPP, uh, Trans Pacific Partnership, this year, possibly next year, uh, Congress has uh, and will have, you know, obviously an important role to play uh, in that. And then there's the question of the lethal arms embargo, which is not maintained under uh, statute or in law. Uh, it's maintained under executive action, but uh, the Congress will have a political role to play because this is something that uh, I think the uh, administration rightly recognizes, as previous ones have, that uh, they don't want to move forward without a degree of congressional support. Um, and what I'd say is just kind of a macro point on this is um, you, you look at a lot of these foreign policy issues uh, and you see a lot of bipartisan rancor and a lot of executive legislative sort of pushing and shoving. Um, and, and I think on this issue, on the U.S.-Vietnam relationship, and I think it's a broader point on, on U.S. policy toward Asia, um, I'd argue there's a, there's a good degree of bipartisan cooperation and a good degree of executive legislative cooperation. Um, you know, on this in particular, uh, you know, I'll just offer one area where I think uh, recently, you know, we, we uh, have been uh, working quite well together, and that is on the lethal arms issue. Um, you know, this is something, as I mentioned, that the executive uh, maintains under its own authority. Um, and there are a number of people on the Hill who rightly look at this, as does my boss, uh, through the lens of uh, sort of how we balance, on the one hand, you know, the sort of strategic and trade issues with the uh, Vietnamese internal issues, governance, human rights, and the aspirations that we have uh, on that. And, you know, I think where we've kind of come uh, on, on the lethal arms embargo, uh, which was sort of memorialized recently in a uh, resolution, Senate resolution, that Senator McCain introduced with uh, Senator Pat Leahy, uh, Senator uh, Cardin, Senator Corker, and others, uh, you know, is, is a prudent step of looking at uh, the real national and, and sort of strategic interests that we have in deepening our cooperation with Vietnam uh, in terms of regional security issues, uh, mill-to-mill uh, issues, uh, and recognizing that Vietnam has recently taken some steps, you know, by no means what we would like to see uh, fully, but, but certainly some steps to improve its human rights record. And, you know, this has essentially created some space, you know, the executive and the legislative uh, branches working together uh, to, to land at a point where I think we are saying essentially, uh, you know, what we would like to see is the embargo eased for the purpose of maritime security and coastal defense. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to envision sort of human rights abuses occurring with uh, 
maritime assets. Um, so let's, let's sort of move out on that for reasons of mutual interest. Um, but we would expect to see sort of further improvements in governance and human rights for us to envision moving much beyond that, uh, particularly getting into internal security issues and uh, dual use items and things of that sort. So, you know, what I would say is I think it's a good, it's a good progression uh, and hopefully it's a, sort of a harbinger of things to come as the executive branch works together with the Vietnamese government, as we work together with the executive uh, to sort of move this partnership forward uh, across all lines of effort. So I'll stop there and happily uh, get into the rest of this with questions. Thanks, Chris. Murray? Thanks. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, you know, the uh, actually, the ironically, the first time that I met Scott, I don't know if he remembers us. He there was a congr when he was in the um, setting up the embassy, be beginning the work on setting up the embassy. He hosted a congressional delegation, and he uh, not a uh, hosted, but he, yeah, maybe he hosted. I don't know what your exact role was, but you were setting up meetings for them, visiting, and um, I think they were from the banking committee or something. And you asked me to come and meet with them, and I think that was, that's the first time I remember meeting you in the old um, Metropole Hotel. Um, it's it's had a considerable facelift since that time. Um, we've gone the other way, at least me, I've gone the other way, but. Um, so what I thought I would do, uh, we've talked a lot already about what, what all the stuff that's happened in the relationship over the last 20 years, uh, a lot of it quite positive. I thought what I would do is pick up some of the points, uh, some of the recommendations from our report that are very specific. Uh, that'll you know help hopefully as the minister deputy minister uh, alluded to deputy prime minister alluded uh, would take us to the next uh, next level, and one you know one that's kind of obvious but maybe needs to be stated uh, is that it would be really good for President Obama to visit. Uh, next year is the 20th anniversary. APEC and the East Asia Summit are both in Southeast Asia, so it's just a small jaunt to stop in Vietnam along the way, Scott. I was <laughs> just kidding. Um, the other, I want to get a little bit also into, the second thing I want to mention is the arms uh, embargo, uh, the, the lifting of the arms ban. Um, uh, you know, it, 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 it is really would represent a significant step forward. And for many people, as, as both uh, Scott and, and Chris alluded to, human rights is not as a key issue on this. And there's been, there's, a, there's been an improvement at a lot of levels. There is a dialogue happening at, at, a, at a, you know, particularly between State Department and the Foreign Ministry. But uh, I'm, we, as we were working on the report and working on this issue, one of the things we thought might be useful is if the U.S. started talking more regularly to the Ministry of Public Security. Uh, I know they are in a little different place. They're not exactly involved in foreign policy and weren't foreign uh, engagement with foreign diplomats. But I think this is a ministry that with which we probably have to, to learn to work more. And then I think it would also be useful for Vietnam to uh, allow in more human, international human rights groups like it did early this year by allowing Amnesty to come in, Amnesty International. And I'm going to, uh, the other, the third point I want to make is about the TPP. Uh, you know, I, I think everybody agrees that it would be good for Vietnam uh, within, within a decade, its, its GDP would just by, uh, you know, having a strong TPP would grow 36%. Uh, but there's considerable work that needs to be done, I think, on both sides to get rid of some trade restrictions and protectionism. Uh, often, the, and I'm, forgive me for those of you that work on trade here in the U.S., uh, often uh, a lot of the criticism is directed at Vietnam, which is probably warranted, but they have some concerns about the United States that probably should be well, uh, mentioned in an environment like this. Uh, but for Vietnam, you know, they're in the process of proposing an excise tax on carbonated drinks. That really only affects a couple of foreign investors. Uh, that's really uh, uh, not a, a terribly smart non-tariff barrier to introduce. But at the same time, the U.S., uh, with uh, uh, some, some members of Congress, have introduced some highly protectionist trade, uh, is highly protectionist health inspection measures against the import of catfish from Vietnam. Uh, that is clearly aimed, uh, it's clearly very protectionist and aimed at protecting uh, U.S. catfish farmers and is not a very competitive uh, uh, trade policy. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm not sure what the administration can do about that, but uh, it is, it is 
from, from as we don't recognize often the differences that, that it, within Vietnam, uh, how trade policy gets formulated, they often don't understand, and to them this looks, looks uh, like a, a kind of move to keep out one sector of Vietnam's economy. Vietnam wants to address is issues like state-owned enterprises, labor, and, or the U.S. rather, wants Vietnam to address state-owned enterprises, labor, environment, and the TPP. But, you know, when you talk to the Vietnamese negotiators, they say, yeah, we, we recognize, particularly on the state-owned enterprises, we need to address that. But we need to, to make it politically palatable in Vietnam. We need, we need a good market access offer from the United States on garments. And we know why that's sort of bogged down right now between the U.S. and Japan, but that's also an uh, you know, important issue to recognize. And then the other thing that sort of sticks in the Vietnamese craw is this issue of, of uh, U.S. having uh, uh, imposed or uh, the, 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 there was an agreement when Vietnam entered the WTO to, to um, uh, uh, that Vietnam would agree to having non-market economy status. Uh, as, as Vietnam liberalizes its economy, as uh, uh, the two countries launch their comprehensive partnership and move in a, in, toward a TPP, it really would be incumbent on the U.S. to, to find ways. I know there are very sp specific regulations to get Vietnam lifted, but when you talk to the Vietnamese, they say, we can name you uh, probably about 80 countries in the world that are less free than us that don't have the status. Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, it would be good to, to start talking about this non-market non economy status for Vietnam. Then I'll mention a few things that we talked about on the people-to-people the -people side. One thing would, that would help on the education side is allowing in Peace Corps volunteers to teach English in the countryside. It's, it seems rather mundane, but in, it would really boost, help boost the Vietnamese education system. The other thing, we've mentioned Fulbright here several times, the, uh, there is now the set up in 1994, the Fulbright Economic Teaching Program. There's now talk of expanding that into a full-fledged Fulbright University. It would be good, uh, and, and uh, uh, President Song mentioned that when he was here. Secretary Kerry mentioned this in Vietnam. It would be really good to start looking for ways to, for both sides to work together from the public, private sector to, to fund this thing, and for Vietnam, this education ministry to agree to have a fully independent board of trustees. And then uh, Scott and, and uh, mentioned this already, as did Chris, the dioxin cleanup. It uh, really does go a long way to improve some of the image uh, uh, after the war. And you know, there's a good remedial effort underway in, in Da Nang, and it'd be good if the similar uh, program was started soon in, in the Bing Hoa Airport. So with that, Ernie, I'll turn it back to you. Uh, thank you for the uh, thoughtful comments, all three of you. I'd like to open the floor to, uh, to questions and observations. David? Uh, they have a microphone coming, sorry. Thank you. Uh, it's David Brunstrom from Reuters. Uh, I was wondering if I could ask uh, both uh, Scott and Chris on the uh, arms embargo issue. Uh, for Scott, uh, I was wondering what, what specific progress may be necessary on the human rights issue to allow uh, a, a decision to be made on that from the administration's point of view. And uh, as far as... Uh, 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 the Hill is concerned, uh, what, what sort of process, this is for Chris, um, uh, are you talking about when you say uh, there needs to be sort of more uh, political uh, activity on that? I mean, how, do, how does it actually, uh, I mean, ha, what, what actually practically needs to be done to clear the way? Um, thanks, I'll, I'll start on the first question. Um, what we've said um, consistently to the Vietnamese for some time is that the overall, that, that progress on human rights is important to our ability to continue to strengthen the overall relationship, including on uh, the security relationship. We've tended not to do, you know, the sort of, if you release three dissidents, we'll do X, you know, be, for a whole host of reasons, um, because what we want to see is broad progress rather than, and, and we certainly don't want to get into, um, you know, if a couple people are released, we'll do X, Y, Z. It's, we don't think that's a healthy thing. So what we're looking at basically is the overall trend on human rights, and, and it, as is usually the case, um, there's some positives, there's some negatives. I mean, you, you know, and, and different people would debate. Uh, my own view is that um, there are there is a lot more space in Vietnam than there was 
five, 10, 20 years ago for people to debate and talk and express their views. Um, that said, there's still um, clearer restrictions and, and, and people who get detained for advocating multi-party democracy. Um, there's certainly area for improvement on the legal side, criminal justice code, these sorts of things. So we you know, are, are hoping to see, as we continue to build a relationship, hoping to see uh, continued progress, but it's not a specific explicit quid pro quo link. Yeah, thanks. And on the U.S. side, I mean, it's not, um, because this embargo is not maintained in law, it's not a matter of you know, congressional action to repeal legislation uh, to change something in statute. I mean, it's, uh, it's more nebulous than that in the sense that um, this embargo is maintained under executive action. What the president and the administration, I think, is looking for uh, is some degree of signal from the Congress that they will have the political support to move forward. Um, what moving forward means, I think, is very much, uh, uh, you know, uh, up to the administration and the Vietnamese government to work out what that process looks like. I think what the Congress has said, uh, you know, is generally, you know, the, the, the kind of framework by which we're thinking about this is um, we recognize that there is a, you know, immediate strategic interest in maritime cooperation. Uh, we also recognize uh, that there have been things done by Vietnam that we think warrant easing the embargo for the purpose of maritime security cooperation. Um, but in order to go forward, we are going to need to see uh, additional steps from the Vietnamese government. Uh, that's something that, you know, the Hill is not going to get into the business of writing into law, you know, the following 15 demands have to be met um, or else. Uh, I think it's more a matter of, you know, congressional leaders, uh, members of the Congress who are visiting Vietnam, uh, many of whom are visiting, you know, quite, you know, with, with sort of increasing regularity uh, because of events in the region and uh, events in the bilateral relationship. So I think more members of Congress are paying attention and are interested. Uh, and I think just the broad point when it comes to human rights, um, I completely agree with what Scott said. I mean, I don't think we want to get into a, you know, we'll give you this ship if you give us these people. It, it just doesn't make sense. I think what we uh, sort of continually try to make clear is uh, what we hope to see are the kinds of changes to law and policy in Vietnam uh, that will eliminate the sort of arbitrary use of power, uh, which is what ends uh, up with the sort of abuses that, that, that we've typically seen. Um, so I think it's really a matter of, of sort of, you know, the institutional change uh, going together with uh, the sort of immediate steps of releases and uh, actions that can be taken like that. But I don't think Congress uh, certainly is not going to get into the business of saying, uh, you know, what specific thing needs to be done in return for what specific action. Um, and in terms of the pathway forward, uh, again, you know, there's nothing particularly to be done legislatively. I think the resolution that senators introduced recently um, you know, be up to the administration to determine. But I think, you know, our view was to send a signal to the administration that there is political support for certain actions, um, but then also make clear that we also expect to see more done uh, in order to move further uh, with, with the sort of increasing uh, easing of the embargo. To be determined. <laughs> Sorry. You're, you're agreeing with that? Yeah. I think okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Paolo von Schirach, Schirach Report. In, in line with some of the other considerations that you've made about institutional changes, you were referring to the political side of things. On the economic side of things, given the opportunities for bilateral relations, I had the, you know, the good fortune of being in Hanoi in 1997 to do a work for the UNDP about public administration reform, which focused primarily on ideas of uh, you know, the future of state-owned enterprises. And you can imagine what that was at the time, 1997. The entire country was owned by the government in terms of assets. How do you, gentlemen, uh, assess the progress, of course, it's been 20 years uh, of progress and liberalization, but you mentioned the fact that Vietnam still doesn't have the coveted status of a free economy. What does it take to get there? And specifically, how do you evaluate the process of privatization and what percentage of uh, national assets and critical sectors are still controlled by the state? And is that 
Do you see that as a significant impediment in the bilateral economic and trade relations going forward, or is this something that you know, we can deal with as things are? Thank you. Murray, you want to start? Well, as you know, in the TPP, uh, there is an effort to have to level the playing field between uh, private sector economies and state-owned enterprises. So, uh, the, but the Vietnamese also recognize that the TPP might help to jumpstart. It's it's really funny, you know. I've been going in and out of Vietnam for a long time, also, and. Uh, uh, as a journalist there in the mid-90s, I was writing these privatization stories, but I read them today and they sound exactly like what I wrote 20 years ago. And it's so that, that's to tell you that the progress has been very slow, uh, very slow. And they don't even call it, they call it equitization rather than privatization. Uh, it is a drag on the economy. Where it is a drag particularly is on the credit side. They get the lion's share, the state-owned enterprises get the lion's share of bank credit, means the private sector has trouble getting credit uh, of significant quantities, and uh, it, it really is, is uh, holding them back. And a lot of officials recognize that, and they hope the TPP, if it's implemented, uh, will help them to you know, give this whole equitization, privatization thing a, a jump start. Thank you. I'm Jin Ning Nguyen, with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. I'm a, an American, and I thank the State Department, thank the Secretary. And I also like to thank Senator McCain for his leadership, and Marie Herbert for all your work. I have three questions for the three of you. First, regarding the human rights, I agree with you uh, of the approach. And, but I feel also that it's universal uh, that Vietnam is a member of the UN, and we feel that we need to support Vietnam together with the UN, and the EU and many other countries also wanted to support human rights. And it's more importantly for the legitimacy of the current government that they show the 90 million Vietnamese that they honor the human rights declaration by the United Nations that they now are a member. That will give tremendous confidence to the people first to uphold the current administration. And so that's the question that I'm asking the State Department. In your dialogue with Vietnam, would you show that we are supporting them because they are afraid that we're turning them or whatever. We're supporting them by supporting civil societies. And ask, I'm asking for more support from the State Department for the civil society, if that is on the table. For uh, Senator McCain, I thank him for his trips, and I support the lift of the lethal uh, weapons for Vietnam. But I want to ask, if the senator in the Foreign Committee Affairs of the Senate pay attention to what the Foreign Minister said, that they are in a strategic relationship with China. Would that create a question for us as the United States? If we happen to be in conflict, direct conflict with China, and Vietnam is in the strategic relationship with China, so our lethal weapon, would that in, in a way affect our national security, the US security? For, for Marie Herbert, my question is with the TPP. I thank you for all the suggestions you have, including the Fulbright University. I think that's tremendous. My question has to do with journalism. So one of the key points for free market is freedom of information. So would you support freedom of internet? Can we have free, independent, magazine, journals, media in Vietnam, not controlled, not censored by the government. That's the only key to the free market so that we can exchange information. And also we need to have independent labor union, independent labor union, that's the key for the free market. Thank you. Thanks. Scott, you want to start? Uh, sure, thanks for your question. Um, I would say when, when we look at Southeast Asia as a whole, not just Vietnam, What's the U.S. interest? We have an interest in peace, stability, 
increased prosperity and broad-based prosperity and democracy and, and, and increased respect for human rights, whether it's Vietnam or any of the other countries. Um, we want to see uh, a strong Southeast Asia that's doing well, and that includes Vietnam. Um, and what, our argument, to get to your question specifically, when we talk to the Vietnamese, when I talk to the Vietnamese government, uh, you know, it's very much in the, you know, we're not in the business of trying to change regimes or, you know, we're in the business of trying to create space and opportunities for people economically and politically. And we think it actually will make Vietnam stronger if, to the extent to which they're able to allow people to have more opportunities, more space. So very much in that mode, including for uh, civil society, because we think it makes the country stronger. So I absolutely agree with you. Chris. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, just briefly, I think, uh, in terms of how, how we are thinking about this, we're not at all uh, trying to say to Vietnam, you know, you have to pick the United States or you have to pick China. Um, nor are we trying to gang up uh, against China with Vietnam. I mean, that's not what this is about. I think the way we're looking at it is uh, exactly to the point that Scott just made. You know, we want to see a strong ASEAN, and we want to see the independence and sovereignty of ASEAN countries uh, protected. We want those countries to have the ability to, uh, to stand up for their own rights, and I think that's how we're looking at this in terms of the context of the relationship with China. Uh, Jeannie, on uh, freedom of the press and freedom of the internet, I totally believe in it. I spent a lot, a lot of time working in that space, and I think it's really very important. And it helps it helps countries to have a more transparent government and have, helps economies to, to work better. So I totally agree. Uh, Jeannie, you got three questions, please. Uh, next question. Andre. Hi, Andre Silvazo, and I'm um, the um, partner and chief representative for a company in Detroit called the Interstate Traveler Company in Vietnam, and some other things that you know about. Anyway, a uh, wonderful panel. Thanks for everything so much. Um, I just, you know, I, maybe people feel they can beat the human rights thing to death, but I'd, I'd like to um, just ask, you know, I'm asking for some intellectual ammunition, because I'm a businessman, I go to Vietnam regularly, as you know. And, and this comes up with Vietnamese friends in the government and all. So what is a answer I can uh, give when somebody asks me, as they have, I, um, well, uh, the United States can export weapons to Saudi Arabia or countries that are just, you know, for atrocities that wouldn't occur in Vietnam are pretty routine. And so what do I, you know, what's the difference in, I mean, here we have 25% women in the National Assembly and, you know, uh, freedom from religion pretty much. And just watch, watch my answer. <laughs> Help! <laughs> Sorry, it's not. <laughs> Andre, I, hey, are you still staying at the Army Hotel when you go there? <laughs> I just got to ask. still stay at the... All right, man. I just just checking on you. <laughs> Some things will never change. Some things will never change. All right. Um, it's a good question. I, I guess the answer would be, um, you know, every every relationship has its own unique history and, and so on. And so, you know, in an ideal world, there'd be perfect consistency. But the reality is that uh, this relationship has a very unique history, as you know better than almost anyone. And um, y you know, we started at, a, at doing and having no relationship, as you know, and have gradually built up. So I think it was in 2005 that we we lifted the complete ban on any military equipment. So you know, we're working our way forward to the extent that the relationship allows it. But I mean, I, I think that's the point. We're, we're, and I think you can tell your Vietnamese friends. I mean, we've been really good partners. We've delivered what we've said we were going to deliver for Vietnam. And, and uh, as they continue to make progress, I think we'll be able to move ahead as well. Scott, I'd like to say what everybody Mr. Hong. Nguyễn Minh Hùng, George Mason University. 
I have a question that is totally different. We talk a lot about maritime security. We also briefly mentioned uh, dispute in South China Sea. And uh, the Asian country and America want China to observe international law. And you want dispute to be solved by international law. And uh, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton also promised that if they need it, we can have to. My question for, for all of you, and particularly for Mr. Rose, is that uh, what is your reading of the Hill positions on the ratification of the UNCLOS? Will they do anything about it, or they will never do anything about it? <laughs> this is all off the record, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I, no, of course. Um, <laughs> You know, the, we, we are not in the position of determining the agenda for the Senate. Um, what I can safely say is that the Law of the Sea Treaty will not be ratified this year. Um, <laughs> ne next year is, you know, anybody's guess. You know, ask me after November. But, um, no, look, I mean, there, there was a real push made on this a year ago and um, came up short. Um, you know, every two years you see what the balance of power looks like and what the leadership of the Senate wants to try to do together with the administration and, you know. Will it help if the Republican win the election? Uh, I could argue it either way, maybe, but um, also depends on, you know, who, who wins these seats, you know, what, what Republicans in particular. Um, uh, I, I would stick with my initial position, which I'm, I'm not putting a lot of money on this happening in the near future. Okay, uh, I think we'll we'll wrap up there. I would just like to uh, to say that um, the the U.S. Vietnam relationship, I think you all could agree, uh, over the last 20 years has uh, gone into incredible areas, and uh, I think Vietnam is uh, important intrinsically to the United States uh, for uh, the reasons that these gentlemen have discussed, and, um, and I do think that the, the view of, of Vietnam's uh, role in ASEAN uh, has significantly changed here in Washington, and, and for me, myself, I think that they have become a much more strategic uh, thinking, or, or are viewed as a much more strategic thinking partner uh, for the United States, and that's very important. And uh, I think the, the energy uh, behind the U.S.-Vietnam relationship means to me that these issues that you guys have discussed today, including the mill-to-mill -mill relationship, are, are truly going somewhere. So stay tuned, folks. Uh, I think you're going to see some interesting developments over the next year. And thank you all for coming. I really appreciate your time and energy. Thank you.